In 1944, as diesel locomotives threatened to wipe out steam for good, railroad engineers poured millions into a single towering gamble, a steam turbine giant that on paper could outrun and outmuscle every rival. Its first run shattered speed records, but within just a few years it disappeared without a trace. How could the machine built to save an industry vanish so completely, and what buried flaw doomed the last hope for steam? The answer begins with a crisis that forced railroads to wager everything on the most radical technology they had ever seen. By the late 1930s, the numbers on railroad ledgers painted a bleak picture. Profits had shrunk to a fraction of their pre-depression highs. Every month, more freight and passengers slipped away to trucks and buses powered by gasoline and diesel engines. Boardrooms filled with uneasy silence as directors studied the latest operating cost reports. On one side of the ledger, the familiar steam locomotive, once the pride of American industry, now demanded constant attention, daily lubrication, water stops every 100 miles, and round-the-clock crews to keep boilers safe and hot. Each year, the bill for keeping these machines running grew heavier. On the other side, a new threat emerged. The diesel electric locomotive, the first EMDFT demonstrators, rolling out in the late 1930s, slashed fuel costs by as much as 40% compared to coal-fired steam, where a steam engine might need a team of six to eight men to operate and maintain, a diesel could run with just two. Maintenance intervals told the rest of the story. A typical steam engine required major servicing after 10,000 miles, sometimes less. Diesels ran 50,000 miles or more between overhauls. For every dollar spent on routine repairs, steam locomotives demanded two or three, often more, just to keep up with daily wear. Investors were restless. In annual meetings, shareholders demanded answers. Why keep pouring money into old technology when the competition offered cheaper, cleaner, and more reliable alternatives? The pressure was relentless. Railroads had spent decades building repair shops, coaling stations, and water towers for steam, but the cold reality of the balance sheet was impossible to ignore. Each new diesel delivered meant another nail in the coffin for the steam era. The cultural cost was just as stark. Steam meant more than machinery, it was tradition, identity, even pride. But pride couldn't pay bills. By 1940, the Pennsylvania Railroad alone was losing ground to diesel-powered rivals who could offer faster schedules and lower rates. The economic squeeze forced railroad executives into a corner. Either find a way to match diesel's efficiency, or accept a slow slide into irrelevance. The search for a miracle solution began in earnest, with every option on the table, no matter how radical. Steam turbines were not just a wild gamble, they were a logical answer to the railroad's mounting problems, at least on paper. In the world of ships and power plants, turbines had already proven their worth. British ocean liners like the RMS Mauritania had been crossing the Atlantic under turbine power since 1906 setting speed records, and running with remarkable smoothness. By the 1920s, turbines had become the backbone of power generation, quietly spinning away in city after city, delivering reliable electricity day and night. Railroad engineers were watching. They saw how turbines delivered continuous rotational force unlike the pounding, back-and-forth motion of pistons. No more hammering of rods and wheels, no more vibrations shaking bolts loose mile after mile. In theory, this meant less wear, fewer breakdowns, and a smoother ride for both passengers and freight. The turbine promise was seductive. Fewer moving parts, less maintenance, and the possibility of running at higher speeds than any conventional steam engine could manage. The numbers seemed to back it up. In marine service, turbine, turbines routinely achieved thermal efficiencies of 30 to 40 percent compared to 15 to 25 percent for even the best piston engines. Swedish engineer Fredrik Ljungström had already built working turbine locomotives as early as 1921. His designs, tested on Swedish state railways, 
covered thousands of miles, and even inspired a British version, the Turbo Motive, by the mid-1930s. That locomotive racked up over 5,000 miles in regular service, pulling heavy express trains with a steady, almost silent power that impressed everyone who rode behind it. For the visionaries at Baldwin Westinghouse and the Pennsylvania Railroad, the appeal was clear. A single turbine could deliver up to 6,800 horsepower, numbers that dwarfed most conventional engines. The S2 project aimed to harness that power in a direct drive configuration, promising mechanical efficiency as high as 97%. If it worked, the railroad could leapfrog past diesel competition, keeping steam alive with a machine that was cleaner, quieter, and theoretically more reliable. It was more than just hope. It was a calculated bet, grounded in the proven success of turbines at sea and in power plants. The dream was simple. Take the best of modern engineering and put it on rails. Building a locomotive that could run faster, pull harder, and outlast anything that came before. The stage was set for a new kind of giant, one that would turn the tide in the battle for the future of American railroads. In the spring of 1944, a team of engineers at Baldwin Locomotive Works and Westinghouse Electric set out to build a machine unlike anything seen on American rails. Their creation, the S2, stood as a monument to ambition, a single prototype towering over its contemporaries in both size and power. The S2's wheel arrangement was six, eight, six, meaning six wheels up front, eight massive driving wheels in the center, and another six trailing behind. This configuration was chosen to support the immense weight of the boiler and the turbine, and to keep the locomotive stable at high speeds. At the heart of the S2 was a direct drive steam turbine, a radical departure from the familiar piston and rod layout. Instead of the pounding of cylinders, the turbine spun smoothly, channeling steam's energy directly into rotation. The design called for an 18.5 to 1 gear ratio, connecting the turbine to the center driving axles. The outer drivers were linked by side rods, but the core of the machine relied on this single, unbroken flow of power. The turbine itself was a Westinghouse masterpiece, built to deliver 6,800 horsepower, more than double what most mainline steam locomotives could muster at the time. Building the S2 was a financial gamble. The project cost the Pennsylvania Railroad $250,000 in 1944, a sum that would top $4 million today. Every detail, from the high-pressure boiler to the custom gear trains, reflected an all-in commitment to pushing the limits of what steam could do. The locomotive stretched more than 122 feet from coupler to coupler and weighed well over 140 tons. Its sleek, streamlined casing and towering profile made it impossible to ignore, even among the giants of the steam age. The S2's direct drive system promised something almost magical. Mechanical efficiency as high as 97%. In theory, this meant nearly all the energy from burning coal would turn into forward motion, with only a sliver lost to friction and heat. No other steam locomotive in the world had ever claimed such a figure. For the designers, this was more than a technical challenge. It was a chance to prove that American engineering could outpace the rising tide of diesel technology. Every bolt, every weld, every calculation pointed toward a single goal, to build a locomotive so advanced it might just save steam itself. March 30, 1945. Headlines across the country carried the same number, 110 miles per hour. That morning, the Pennsylvania Railroad's S2 thundered out of Fort Wayne, Indiana, hauling a 17-car train bound for Chicago. Onlookers lined the tracks, drawn by rumors of a machine unlike anything they had seen. The S2's sleek shroud glinted in the spring sunlight, its six leading wheels and eight massive drivers blurring into a single silver streak. Inside the cab, engineers kept a close eye on the gauges as the turbine spun up delivering a surge of power that felt almost limitless. Unlike the pounding rhythm of pistons, 
The S2 accelerated with a steady, rising whir. No hammering, no vibration, just a smooth rush of speed. By the time the train reached its measured mile, the needle hovered at 110. Reporters on board scribbled furiously, describing a ride so smooth they could balance coins on the windowsill. Railroad officials boasted that the S2 was setting a new standard for American railroading. The press wasted no time. Steam turbine sets speed record blared the headlines. Photographs of the S2, nose tilted forward like a racing yacht, appeared on front pages from Philadelphia to Los Angeles. Editorials praised the locomotive as a symbol of American ingenuity and recovery in the final months of war. Public relations officers from Baldwin and Westinghouse fielded calls from magazines eager to feature the S2's cutting-edge technology. For a brief moment, the S2 was the star of the railroad world. Engineers spoke of the locomotive's 6,800 horsepower with pride, comparing it to the mighty turbines driving the world's fastest ships. Some industry insiders whispered that this was the breakthrough steam needed to reclaim its throne from diesel. For passengers and observers along the line, the S2's record run was more than a technical feat. It was a promise that steam power still had a future, delivered at breathtaking speed. Every promise made by the S2 designers collided with hard numbers. As soon as the locomotive entered real service, in the shop logs, Foreman recorded the same complaint again and again. Fuel vanished at a staggering pace. On paper, the S2's direct drive turbine should have delivered efficiency unseen in any American steam engine. In reality, the S2 burned through coal at rates that startled even veteran firemen, 12 pounds of coal for every horsepower hour delivered to the wheels. On a typical run, the tender emptied faster than the schedule allowed, forcing unscheduled stops just to refuel. The turbine's appetite was only part of the problem. Mechanics soon noticed the S2 spent more time on the shop floor than out on the main line. Mean time between failures rarely topped 5,000 miles. By contrast, the new diesel electrics ran 50,000 miles before needing major repairs. The S2's complex gear trains and high-speed bearings demanded constant attention. Replacement parts were not sitting on the shelf. Each breakdown meant waiting for custom machined components from Westinghouse or Baldwin. Shop foremen grumbled about the weeks lost to repairs, and the overtime bills piled up. Weight was another silent saboteur. The S2 tipped the scales at more than 140 tons, over 20 tons heavier than comparable steam locomotives. That extra mass pressed down on the rails, straining bridges and increasing track maintenance costs. At every division point, crews checked for signs of rail fatigue and worried about the impact on the aging infrastructure. The locomotive's six leading wheels and six trailing wheels helped spread the load, but the central drivers still bore the brunt, leading to accelerated wear and more frequent wheel truing. Operational records from 1945 to 1948 tell the same story in cold figures, catastrophic fuel consumption at low and medium speeds, frequent mechanical failures, and a maintenance burden that outpaced any savings from the turbine's theoretical efficiency. The S2's dazzling performance at 110 miles per hour made headlines, but most railroad work happened far below those speeds, where the turbine's efficiency collapsed. In switching yards and on hilly divisions, the S2 was a liability. Crews joked that it could empty its tender before it left the city limits if asked to switch cars for an hour. For the men tasked with keeping the S2 running, the marvel of American engineering became a daily headache. Shop mechanics learned to dread the arrival of the turbine giant. Each visit meant days of troubleshooting, hunting for leaks in the high-pressure steam lines, and coaxing worn bearings back to life. The S2 was a technological wonder, but the evidence collected in shop ledgers and fuel logs made one conclusion impossible to avoid. The numbers simply did not add up. The turbine giant was built to save steam, but its hidden flaws made that dream impossible. 
In the winter of 1948, Pennsylvania Railroad executives gathered behind closed doors, poring over a mountain of repair invoices and shop reports. The S-2's promise had faded into a string of costly breakdowns and spiraling bills. By then, the locomotive had racked up more time in the Altoona shops than on the main line, each visit demanding custom parts and expensive labor. The repair costs alone had already surpassed $56,000, more than a fifth of the original construction budget. Every week brought new requests for turbine blades, high-speed bearings, and gear assemblies that only Westinghouse could make, and always at a premium. The numbers were impossible to ignore. The boardroom grew tense as the chief mechanical officer presented the latest tally. The S2's annual maintenance expenses had climbed to nearly double those of a comparable diesel electric. Worse, the locomotive's catastrophic fuel consumption at low speeds meant that even on days it ran, it lost money with every mile. The coal bill for a single round trip between Harrisburg and Chicago outstripped the cost of running two diesel electrics over the same distance. Shop foreman, once proud to host the turbine giant, now quietly lobbied for its retirement, citing endless overtime and a growing backlog of deferred repairs on the rest of the fleet. Directors weighed the sunk costs against the mounting losses. Every dollar spent on the S2 was a dollar not invested in new diesels, which were now proving themselves across the network. The company's accountants projected that even with optimistic service intervals, the S2 would never recoup its development costs. The turbine's record-breaking speed run had faded from memory, replaced by the reality of empty tenders and stranded trains. The board's decision was unanimous. The S2 would be withdrawn from active service by the end of 1949. No press release announced the locomotive's fate. The S2 was quietly sidelined, shunted to a siding at the Altoona shops, its streamlined casing gathering dust. Official company histories made little mention of the project, and internal memos instructed staff to focus on the future, dieselization, modernization, and cost control. Within months, the S2's tender was drained, its firebox cold for the last time. The dream of a turbine-powered future had ended not with a dramatic accident or public scandal, but with a silent vote in a paneled room. Five years later, another experiment met the same end, in 1954, the Norfolk and Western locomotive John Henry, a massive coal-fired steam turbine locomotive, was withdrawn after only two years of troubled service. The pattern was unmistakable. Railroad executives across the country learned the same lesson. No amount of engineering brilliance could overcome the cold arithmetic of operating costs and reliability. The turbine giants, once symbols of hope, were quietly dismantled and sold for scrap, their names erased from company records. The era of steam innovation had closed, not with a bang, but with a retreat behind the boardroom door. Innovation that dazzles on paper can vanish overnight if it cannot outpace real-world demands. Today, as new technology races to disrupt transportation again, from hydrogen to autonomous systems, the story remains unchanged. Brilliance alone is never enough. Progress favors what works, not what wows. The next revolution will be decided not in headlines, but on tracks, roads, and balance sheets. What survives shapes the future. Share your thoughts in the comments below.